The pro-Irish Republican Party Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill recently became the first nationalist first minister of Northern Ireland. The British-ruled province saw decades of sectarian violence followed by a fractious peace. So could a reunited Ireland finally be, as Michelle O'Neill says, within touching distance, or does it remain a pipe dream? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. A deal between Northern Ireland's two main parties last month ended two years of political deadlock. But the British government appears to be in no mood to even talk about a referendum on reunifying the North, ruled by London, and the Republic of Ireland. Roundtable's Jen Carswell travelled to Belfast to assess the mood for Irish reunification. Atrocities depicted in art remembering the thousands killed on both sides. These murals show the death and destruction that was part of everyday life just 30 years ago. This wall and others like it was erected to keep Catholics and Protestants apart. It's a physical barrier to stem the violence and it's a real reminder of this country's recent history. Crisscrossing the streets of Belfast, Union Jacks and since the war in Gaza, Israeli flags signify Protestant, largely unionist areas while Irish and Palestinian flags signify Catholic, usually Republican areas. These two communities live side by side, but have a deep distrust for one another. To understand Northern Ireland, you have to understand its origins. The foundation of the state in 1921 was built on a Protestant majority. So all the policies of the state, it was very heavily discriminatory. And for a number of decades, this built up grievances which exploded in the 1960s into what we call the Troubles. Uh, and that's where the Catholic minority um, started protesting. They wanted equal rights, uh, one person, one vote. So Northern Ireland, the whole fabric of Northern Ireland has always been based on sectarianism of some sort. In 1998, the Good Friday Agreement was signed, bringing an end to the armed conflict. A power-sharing arrangement was agreed between parties representing Catholics and Protestants and crucially recognised both Irish and British identities of the population. I think that the Good Friday Agreement settled the constitutional question here. Most people were happy with the outcome, which meant that you could be Irish or British and we would remain as part of the UK until the majority of people wanted otherwise or decided otherwise. Ben Collins grew up in a staunchly Unionist household. But over time, he decided the best place for Northern Ireland was unified with the South. Having lived in Britain actually made me feel more Irish and less British. If you look at um, across the island of Ireland, we have two health systems, we have two education systems, um, uh, two, two economies that are trying to come together, trying to work in the, the common good. Then in 2016, everything changed. The UK voted to leave the EU. Brexit is a political revolution. Brexit has been, it's been a disaster. Brexit changed everything. Brexit created a constitutional crisis, an existential crisis, where people began to think, do I want to be in the UK or do I want to be part of United Ireland? Questions that gained serious attention after, earlier this year and for the first time ever, the Republican Sinn Féin party won the most seats and Sinn Féin leader Michelle O'Neill became Northern Ireland's first minister. One of Sinn Féin's main objectives has always been reunification. But a poll suggests that that reality is still a way off. 39% say they want reunification, 49% want to stay part of the UK, 11% are undecided, and 1% would not vote at all. All of the elections uh, have shown that there's still a unionist majority, albeit that that sometimes is hidden by the fact that the unionist vote is much more fragmented than the Republican vote would be. There's one Republican party, there are about five different unionist parties, this is Stormont, where decisions for Northern Ireland are made. But for years at a time, the government hasn't been functioning, and that means that the issues facing the people of Northern Ireland are piling up. I think for people here, the number one priority is a period of stability. They want to see education working. They want to see the health service delivering. They want the issues of infrastructure address, and they want a strong economy. Northern Ireland has underperformed compared to the rest of the UK and Ireland, even before the pandemic. Does a better future align with the UK and the status quo? 
of course. I would prefer to have the security of being part of the fifth largest economy in the world rather than be joined to a small nation which is tossed about by all the economic and political and geopolitical turbulence which exists in the world today. Or as part of Ireland within the European Union and its giant training bloc. It is about that unity, it's about bringing people together, it's about bringing the two education systems together, it's about bringing the two health systems together to get more efficient. You know, you don't need to be an economist to know that having two of something is more expensive than having one of something, and I think it's about leveraging all the benefits that there are being part of the EU. What both sides seem to agree on, though, the world is changing. More people in Northern Ireland now identify as Catholic than Protestant, a seismic shift. Young people do not carry the baggage of the Troubles, and Brexit has served as a cautionary tale. If you were to have a referendum on something that's as complex and emotive as this, without doing the proper planning, if it's a rushed job, if it's a botched uh, referendum, then the consequences could be catastrophic. Despite what's written on the ballot paper, reunification in Northern Ireland is a lot more than just yes or no. It's history, it's religion, it's economics, it's prosperity, and it's a big decision. Jen Carswell, Roundtable, TRT World, Belfast. Well, let's meet our guests. Joining us from Dublin is Ivana Batchik. She is leader of the Irish Labour Party. In Liverpool in England is Jonathan Tung. He is Professor of Politics at the University of Liverpool. And in Surrey in the UK is Aaron Edwards, Honorary Research Fellow in the School of History, Politics and International Relations at the University of Leicester. A very warm welcome to Roundtable to all of you. Ivana, I'll come to you first. Sinn Féin, their leader Mary Lou Macdonald have said that they want a border poll within the next five years. Is, is that realistic? What's important to say, I suppose, is that for us in Labour, we too would like to see a unity referendum. We're Connollyite Republicans, so we do want to see a united Ireland, and we certainly want to see a referendum held. But we think at this point, it's not a good idea to prescribe a time frame, or certainly not quite such a tight time frame as five years. I do think what we need to see is a start of a process towards the holding of a unity referendum. But what we have heard, or what we have learned, particularly from the Brexit experience, is the need to lay the groundwork. And of course, you know, also the need to ensure absolute uh, uh, abiding by those core principles in the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement, which is now 26 years old, and which, you know, has consent at, the, at its heart. The SDLP has convened a New Ireland Commission that again is about looking at consent-based principles and uh, and looking at how you achieve uh, a referendum on unity that will not itself cause ca cause a return, frankly, to, to the conflict of the past. You know, that's the thing I think we're all united in wanting to avoid. And we've moved so far, and it's so good now, and to see the Stormont Assembly back up and running, to see the executive back up and running, to see photos like the ones we saw today of Emma Little Pengelly and Michelle O'Neill as, as uh, the two first ministers, you know, playing Gaelic together. That's a really well initiative uh, and it's and it's very good to see. I know that, that now in, in this island we're talking about the Smile Sisters to replace the Chuckle Brothers that uh, uh, that we saw before uh, when the peace process was 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 really kick-started and when we saw the uh, the Good Friday Agreement first signed 20, 26 years ago. Let's bring in Jonathan. Just talk us through the mechanics of how a border poll would happen. So it is over to the British Secretary of State for Northern Ireland to trigger any such poll. That's correct, Jonathan. Yeah, it's the British Secretary of State's exclusive call. The British Secretary of State is legally obliged to call a border poll if he or she believes that there is a majority in favour of constitutional change. That is, that opinion polls would suggest or whatever other criteria are used, and they're not specified. But if in the, in the view of the Secretary of State, there is a majority for constitutional change, he is legally obliged to call a border poll. And if there is a vote for a United Ireland in that border poll, then the British government is legally bound to implement uh, a United Ireland. At the moment, if you average across the opinion polls, we're about at 50% support for Northern Ireland remaining in the United Kingdom. But it's not as if the other 50% all want a United Ireland. They're split between uh, support for United Ireland coming, averaging around 35% and the rest don't know. So in other words, the conditions have not currently been met. 
by which the Secretary of State is obliged to call a border poll, even though we know that Sinn Féin has done very, very well in recent elections in Northern Ireland to become the largest party in the Assembly, the largest party in local government, and they could become the largest party even though they don't take their seats uh, at the forthcoming Westminster election. So we haven't got fixed criteria. There's no, the Secretary of State can't be bound, and this has gone to the courts, as to what criteria to use, whether it be election results, whether it be opinion polls. But basically, those, that, it's that 15% don't know that, if you like, hold the balance of power. If you've got 50% supporting NI in the UK, 35% supporting United Ireland, 15% don't know, then it's up to Irish Republicans and Irish nationalists to win over all the don't knows to get the border poll on. I think that's a difficult task. It's not an impossible one. I think a border poll will be held someday. But I think that Sinn Féin's ambition of having one so soon, within the next decade, five years, whatever, I think that's probably ambitious. I think it might be on the longer finger unless they can convert people pretty quickly. Aaron, I had lunch last week with a friend who is a unionist, and he said to me, hand on heart, uni unionism has failed over the last two decades. And he said, I'm worried. I'm worried about the future. And he's from a community that does not want to see a united Ireland. But he said, look, one day, I think it's inevitable. What do you think? Well, the, the idea of uh, United Ireland being inevitable and, uh, and the end of the United Kingdom, the union between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, being uh, close to finished is something that's been around for a long time. I mean, this narrative is one that's played up, particularly by uh, Republicans associated with Sinn Féin, uh, and seen in many ways uh, in recent weeks as being within touching distance uh, by Mary Lou Macdonald uh, and others who have expressed that opinion because that's, of course, their first uh, uh, main principle uh, in this transition process. But there remains to be quite a number of people uh, persuaded of that. And I know that despondency within unionism is certainly something that has recently manifested itself in terms of apathy at the polls and a little bit of uh, uh, damage politically to the DUP. But there is a view, I think, within unionism that not all is lost and that a return to the assembly and the power sharing institutions is the best way to make the case for unionism, political unionism, uh, into the future and to, in, in a sense, um, deny um, Irish nationalists and Republicans the ground that they think they've taken in terms of pushing for a border poll in the near future. So unionism is by no means uh, at death's door uh, as a political um, uh, uh, organisation or, or uh, um, political parties, um, but certainly it is not in rude health. Aaron, can I just ask you, how important is the whole issue of young people in Northern Ireland being dragged out of the European Union against their will? I mean, do you think that might play into the factor that the Republic of Ireland will always be in the European Union? Are, are young people in the North of Ireland looking kind of almost jealously at the South because they're still in the EU? Younger people generally are seen as much more progressive in their political identities uh, and than the older generation. So within unionism, there is a uh, an older generation, uh, 60 and above, that are almost die hard in their British unionism. But there are those younger uh, members of the community that are more open to having uh, different identities and with a European dimension, of course. But uh, given that the United Kingdom as a whole has moved um, to leave the EU, even though Northern Ireland is one, one foot in, one foot out, I think that um, the, the narrative that we see um, being um, used at the moment is that uh, it's it, you know you can really get uh, the benefit of both worlds, uh, both EU and and UK, uh, with the set of circumstances that we have under the Windsor framework. But I think that young people are tend to be uh, a little bit more positive and upbeat in their thinking. But of course, that could go in different directions, and and so the challenge for unionism is to make what is sometimes seen as a a stuffy, um, uh, male-dominated political tradition uh, relevant to younger people today. Well, let's just have a listen to two of the leading voices in this conversation. Mary Lou Macdonald, who you mentioned, is the leader of Sinn Féin in the Republic of Ireland, and Geoffrey Donaldson is a very prominent figure in unionist politics in Northern Ireland. He's leader of the DUP. Uh, let's just have a listen to them now. You see, more and more people are now seriously considering the future 
and the shape of constitutional change. And friends, the reunification of Ireland is firmly on the table. In the South, this appetite for change has already seen the political landscape transformed. Sinn Féin is now the largest party in Northern Ireland, but it gets less than 30% of the vote. Mary Lou Macdonald said, a united Ireland is within touching distance, and I did say, tongue-in-cheek to Irish radio, she must have the longest arms in the island of Ireland, because, you know, that's just not where we are. Ivana, one question that always comes up around Ireland when this topic is broached is, who's going to pay for it? Yes, you're right, Enda. That is a question that's asked very frequently. I think, certainly for us as a social democratic party, we'd be very conscious uh, that reunification can bring huge benefits for uh, disadvantaged communities, both north and south of the border, that we see, we see unification not as a goal in itself, not as a sort of fourth green field aspect, but because we do want to build a better and more equal Ireland in which we share the benefits of prosperity across the island. So for us, us, you know, goals like building a 32 county universal access healthcare system or a, uni or a 32 county secular education system. These are the real goal goals, not, you know, uh, the, the flag, not, not the flag. In fact, as John Hume famously said, you can't eat a flag. So I think, again, you know, more progressive parties in the north have always been aware that it's not just a nationalist cause, that unification has to be pursued as a way of achieving greater equality and a better society for everyone. And I, so I think, you know, to come back to your point, I think the, co the benefits will outweigh the cost in unification. I mean, we're seeing, you know, huge uh, advances made when we when we work uh, on a cross border basis. And there's lots of examples of that. I mean, you know, not least, I suppose, rug in rugby, where we have cross border uh, success uh, for the Ireland team. Um, but also, you know, more le outside of the sports arena, we see in business, we see on energy, for example, on energy initiatives, we see the importance of working cross border we've really important organizations like waterways ireland which are which are all island already the trade union movement is all island and we're the party of the trade union movement and so for us you know the cause of labor across the island is, is very very important the need to further and to enhance workers' rights on, a, on an all-island basis is important. The need to ensure human rights protections uh, across the island is important. And actually, this has come up in, in the... And, and there's a, a bell, so I'll be having to go shortly. But the uh, the call, you know, the, this has come up recently in the context of the awful Rwanda legislation brought in by the Tories in Britain, that those who might face deportation from Northern Ireland to Rwanda... Um, you know, are not clearly not having equivalent human rights protection to those who, who might, uh, those who are seeking asylum in the process uh, in, in operation in this jurisdiction in Ireland. So, uh, and I know Stella Creasy, uh, the Labour MP, has raised this issue in Westminster already. So I think, you know, the costs, uh, there certainly would, will be some cost, of course, to unification, you know, very basic things like changing administration and so on. But I think the benefits for all of our communities will outweigh the cost. And I think most people, certainly in this jurisdiction, believe that and I think increasing numbers in the north too. Ivana, I appreciate your time today. We know you've got to go vote in the Dáil, which is the Parliament in Dublin. So thank you for joining us on Roundtable. We'll see you again. Jonathan, I want to get your opinion on the polling on all of this. So let's look at what Ipsos have done in 2022. This is a poll that showed two-thirds of voters in the Republic of Ireland are in favour of a united Ireland. But half of voters in Northern Ireland are against unification. So my question to you really is, can you see that changing anytime soon? Yes, I can see things changing in the North. If we deal very quickly with the South first, there's been consistently a majority in favour of a united Ireland in the South. It's true that the majority diminishes if you start adding caveats like higher taxes, but there's always a, ma a basic majority in favour of Irish unity in the South. In the North, the picture has changed quite dramatically since Brexit. Previously, you had polls suggesting there was no prospect of a united Ireland. Uh, there was extensive support for Northern Ireland remaining in the United Kingdom. The first point is to say support for Northern Ireland remaining in the United Kingdom is now down to 50%. It's a bare majority, uh, if that. That doesn't mean to say, though, that everyone else supports a united Ireland. You're at 35% average support for a united Ireland. And it, the question begged is how to get that up, to win over the don't knows uh, that exist. Uh, there's plenty of, of don't knows. 
But if you look since Brexit, there has been an increase in those wanting unification. They've still got some distance to travel. The unionist overall block vote, that is the vote for all unionist parties, has fallen by 10% since the Good Friday Agreement. So unionism is in decline, but nationalism and republicanism need to increase their position further. The other big factor, of course, is what the swing voters in a border poll will be those in the centre ground, those who say, I am neither a unionist nor a nationalist. At the moment, they are still pro-Northern Ireland staying in the United Kingdom, more support the constitutional status quo than oppose it. The main party that represents them, though, the Alliance Party, we've done recent re research only recently, which suggests that there are now more members within that party who support Irish unification than support the constitutional status quo. That's quite a turnaround for a party of the centre ground. Aaron, do you think a lot of young moderate unionists will be looking at this conversation and thinking, well, hang on, if there were a united Ireland, part of the European Union, there would be unbelievable financial investment in Northern Ireland. The Americans would come on board. There would be more jobs created, employment prospects, universities, everything would improve. I mean, is this, is this something that you think could swing over young people who would traditionally align themselves with the British identity? I think it depends on the context within which a border poll is called. And um, economically, I mean, a lot of states around the world aren't doing so well. Uh, and, uh, and so that investment that you mentioned there from the United States or from the European Union we could find ourselves in very difficult circumstances economically um, because of various crises that have been ongoing since 2008 um, in the world economy. And, and so there, I think that intersecting with that will be the political will um, in both Dublin and Belfast, or sorry, Dublin, Belfast and in London to uh, you know, make uh, the border poll sellable to the greater number of people. And I think that's where the uh, the inclusive agenda that Ivana talked about is really important, that political investment will only really come when uh, the societal divisions within Northern Ireland are significantly healed in order to uh, permit a, a you know very conscious vote and a well-informed vote to happen that isn't uh, organised along tribal lines. I mean, we, we know the dangers of uh, the very uh, slender... Um, uh, leave vote in Brexit, uh, and uh, and so that has remained uh, uh, certainly something that has haunted uh, politicians since then. That if a border poll is to be called, that they need to ensure that there is uh, a decent majority beyond the fifty plus one that we've uh, historically been talking about since nineteen ninety eight, uh, and what's embedded in the Good Friday Agreement. I think that what I'm really saying is the context could change further. Jonathan, for so long we've seen politics in Ireland being the domain of hatred, division. We've seen bloodshed, murder, terrorist atrocities. We're now seeing young politicians, many of them female, who are reaching out to the other community. Ivana referenced Michelle O'Neill and Emma Little Pengeli uh, playing hurling the other day, or camogie, in West Belfast. I mean, this. For many generations, this would have been completely unthinkable to see one community reaching out to the other and engaging in such a fashion. Yeah, things are vastly improved in Northern Ireland. It's worth remembering that. The Good Friday Agreement has not been a huge success as a political deal in some ways because the political institutions it created have been subject to regular collapse. They've been missing in inaction for 40% of the time since the Good Friday Agreement. It might be a hope against history that the current restoration is sustained, the current honeymoon period can be managed. But the Good Friday Agreement, even if you have doubts about the future of the political institutions again, let's remember the Good Friday Agreement was a monumental success as a peace deal. The death toll has dropped dramatically. There's very little violence these days. It's true that there are dissident groups trying to claim the title deeds of the IRA. It's true that loyalist paramilitaries have not disappeared, but the level of violence is a fraction of what it was, and it's always worth remembering that. In terms of the politics of it, it's still true, you know, there are still nearly 100 peace walls dividing communities in Belfast. It's still true that there is a huge amount of work to be done in terms of reintegrating the two communities who are educated apart, 
who, who don't see each other across communal divides often until the age of 18, uh, if at all, huge housing segregation, educational segregation. There's an awful lot of work to be done to reintegrate Northern Ireland. And I think it's really important, therefore, upon its political leaders to show an example from the top. Aaron, everything you're seeing from this new generation of political leaders, are you hopeful for the future? Do you think that there can be a prosperous future for Northern Ireland, regardless of whether there is a united Ireland? You know, as John said, we need to look at the, uh, the pluses and the minuses here. And certainly uh, over the past 25 years, even longer, uh, going back to the formation of the Northern Ireland um, uh, uh, government uh, a partition um, over 100 years ago, um, there's always been a zero-sum mentality that's permeated those political institutions and political life generally. And if we can get to a win-win situation where uh, you know we have a union, whatever form that takes, whether that's a, an Irish union or a union um, uh, continuing to be a union between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, I think has to be built on uh, fundamental principles of inclusivity you know, progressive politics, and I, I don't mean that necessarily in a social democratic way, but certainly um, compromise-ridden uh, politics rather than conflict-ridden politics, uh, and also a benevolence within that union, you know, that the people uh, will organise themselves in a way that's uh, mutually benefit, uh, beneficial to all. Aaron, Jonathan and Ivana Bacic of Labour, thank you all so much for your insight on this roundtable. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for Roundtable TRT World, and if you like what you see, please do hit that subscribe button. But for now, from me, Enda Brady, and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.